This is, as I said, our inaugural meeting. And the whole purpose of this is to just begin a dialogue between the cities on what we can do to become more productive as a unit rather than looking more myopically as just cities, our, our individual city. Where do we have assets? Where do we have avenues that we can take that would make this a much more viable re region from an economic development standpoint versus where we are today? It's just a conversation. And we hope that we're able to get to a certain point where it'll get legs on its own and continue. And I think it's an important conversation to have. What motivated me to, to try and, and um, work with the group to put this together, is you look at what's happening in our region up in the, at the PCID area and now with the coming expansion of the Georgia 400 interchange, what that's going to mean. You look at what's going on in the, Dor in the Doraville area with the coming transformation of the GM plant and that's going to be one of the most vital economic redevelopment programs in the state. I mean, so right here on our outside corners, We've got these two phenomenal events that are going to have just a significant, it could have, they are, they are going to have a significant impact on us, but are we going to be able to take advantage of that to the maximum? That's, and that's the purpose for being here, recognizing what's coming down the road, taking some uh, um, considerations to think about, some, we can prepare for it, we can organize ourselves. We want to talk about uh, what the opportunities are, what the obstacles are, and... Um, we're going to hopefully have this be a fast-paced um, conversation. So, as you can see, I'm going to start, before I introduce the panel, with uh, what was devised as a mission statement. It's always good to have a mission statement so you know where you're going. To start a collaborative and, sus and sustaining dialogue to raise awareness of the economic development opportunities in the emerging DeKalb Northern Arc currently consisting of Dunwoody, Brookhaven, Shambly, and Doraville. Our goals are threefold. One is to empower cooperation between existing and emerging DeKalb Northern Arc municipalities. Two, optimize economic opportunities within the Arc. And three, enhance and embrace the existing collective resources of the DeKalb Northern Arc. So, we're going to be covering a variety of subject matters today, from ethics, to arts and culture, education, workforce readiness, transportation, and hopefully some, a few others, if we have time. We're starting a little late, so I'm going to kind of like move this along fairly quickly. Um, we have a distinguished panel that, can participate, that will be participating in this today, and I really want to thank every one of you for coming and taking away from your, your time. I know it's precious. But this represents the stakeholders along the Northern Arc. We have every chamber represented. We have every city represented. Uh, we have major stakeholders here from ARC to PCID to Cab County Economic Development. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. And in the back, we have our legislatures, both state and um, House representatives. So anybody that has a fingerprint on what's going on, or the majority, majority of the people who have a fingerprint on what's going on in this region, that can help add to the conversation. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry? Yeah. I'll let you do that. Todd has to take a second for a commercial break to recognize our sponsors. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. Todd Lantier, Chairman of the Board of the Brookhaven Chamber of Commerce. That's my empty seat up there sitting next to Katarina, but uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming and welcome all of you to Brookhaven. What's uh, unique about this spot right here is if you look across the street, that's Shambly. If you look on the other side of 285, that is Dunwoody. So this is a very uh, um, strategic position for this particular area, and I think I couldn't, can't think of a more fitting place to have it here in this great hotel. So how many of you were walked in here and said, wow, this is a Holiday Inn, this is great? Isn't it nice? Food's great. Good people. Is Tracy here? There's Tracy in the back. If you uh, want to talk with Tracy afterwards, we're really, really grateful. We put her through the ringer to get this done in a short time period. So thank you so much. Um, I would, first of all, definitely like to thank our staff. Uh, Casey Dudek, our Chief Executive Officer. Casey, where are you? Outside. He misses it. 
Melissa Bryson, Buzz McCumber, Carrie Witt. Who else is here? Thank you guys for, oh, hi Mary Ellen, you, you. Thank you so much for all your help getting this all together. These folks have done a tremendous job. Um, some of our sponsors today, DeKalb Chamber of Commerce has come forward and they said, yes, it's important to us that we part, be part of this whole initiative. Uh, the Brookhaven Post, Trey, thank you so much for your sponsorship, Terra Terroir. They're actually hosting a uh, happy hour after this. They're down in uh, on Peachtree Road across from the Marta Station in Brookhaven. So if you'd like to join us afterwards, JLB Partners, Callenwald Fine Arts Center is doing a donation in kind. It's a nice treat. I think that you will be uh, very surprised by that. Keystone Press, Wit and Associates um, made a nice contribution. Uh, JP, uh, Jefferson Property Advisors, as well as uh, National Financial Services Group. Um, so thank you to all of our sponsors. If you've had something to drink or eat, let's hear it for our sponsors. Thank you, all of you, for that. All right, Joe, are we doing this? No. We're here? Uh, yes. We're here. So now we're here. That's correct. We're moving along. We're moving along. The clock is ticking. Um, let's do a recognition real quick. Um, I'd like to recognize who's on the dais with us. Um, Katarina Taylor, who is the new president of the DeKalb Chamber of Commerce, wave. Uh, Todd Lantier, he is the uh, chairman of the board for the Brookhaven Chamber of Commerce. Bob Dallas, who are you here for, Bob? I'm just kidding. Dunwoody Chamber of Commerce. And then Luke Howe? No, Van. No, I'm sorry. Van, Van Pappas. Van Pappas. I'll do this. You, go ahead. <laughs> You got the chambers. I'll do these guys. Van Pappas, who is the chairman of the board of the Chambly Chamber of Commerce, and he's also the chairman of the board of the Downtown Development Authority, if I'm not mistaken. We have Luke Howe, who is the director of economic development from uh, Doraville. Um, you want to go in the yeah, background? Okay, here we go. And we're honored to have our, uh, our interim CEO from DeKalb County, Lee May. Lee, thank you for coming. We have the mayor pro tem, Rebecca Chase Williams from the city of Brookhaven, filling in for J. Max Davis. Mayor Mike Davis from Dunwoody, and Mayor Donna Pittman from Doraville. On the back row over here, we have our politicians, and... We have our elite group of elected officials. Thank you for that. First, um, Fran Miller is not here right now. He'll be joining us, State Senator from District 40. We have Mike Jacobs is not here yet. He is going to be um, State uh, House Rep for District 80. Tom Taylor is here. He's the State House Rep for District 79. We have uh, Scott Holcomb, State Rep District uh, 81. And we have Jeff Rader, who is our DeKalb County Commissioner for District 2. Uh, and we do have some elected officials who are not so, on the uh, dais. Tom Hogan is here from yes. the city of Chambly. Tom, Tom Hogan, city councilman. Good, Tom, thank and you for coming. In the back row is Mr. Clarkston, the mayor of Chambly. And we have uh, Eric Clarkston, please. Thank you from the city of Chambly. Um, why don't you do the front row? Did we miss anyone? Oh, yeah, we oh. have Bates Madison, my cohort here on the city council at the city of Brookhaven. Okay. Outstanding. Okay. So representing, oh my gosh, yes, Marie. Hey, Brian, how are you? Great to see you again. Thank you so much, Marie, our city manager. Thank you. That's why you're on top of everything. You're so good. Thank you. We got everyone. Okay. So we'll start at the far end and we'll work our way down. We have, uh, just bear with me here, guys. We have Doug Stoner, who's the managing director of the De Development Authority of DeKalb County. We have... Mary Ellen McClanahan, who is the project manager for, uh, the, for Metro Atlanta and in our district, uh, Mary Ellen, this is District 3, and it's DeKalb County, Fulton County, and Douglas County? And Cherokee, and Cherokee County. So she, is, she works with, uh, in special projects with the uh, Georgia Department of Economic Development. We have from PCID, or the Perimeter uh, Community Improvement District, is the President Yvonne Williams. Thank you so much, Yvonne. The gentleman who just took the microphone, Mr. Vaughn Irons, is the chairman of the board of the Development Authority of DeKalb County. And finally, here we have Dan Reuter, who is with the Atlanta Regional Commission. And what's your... I'm the community development manager. Community development manager from the Atlanta Regional Commission. 
Once again, I really want to thank each of you for coming and giving your time today for this important conversation. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to bring up a subject matter uh, that is sensitive to everybody, and we're all aware of it. And um, Lee, I'm going to call on you first. The microphone is here. Would you pass it back, please? This is an important subject matter that we, as a community, need to address. And I'll start off by saying, hey, we've got an 800-pound gorilla in the room, and it's about ethics. I mean, I was walking in, and the TV was blaring all the things that are going on in DeKalb County. So from an economic development standpoint, we're trying to attract businesses that come in here, and they're out there, and they're researching us and saying, what is DeKalb County all about? Unfortunately, it's these negative messages for us a long period of time that have been out there that really probably do us a lot more harm than they do us good. So I'm going to just put it directly to you. Um, if you would like to comment on your perspective of this, what you're doing, and what you think we need to be doing down the road. And I appreciate your participation. Oh, before you do that, I do want to make one comment, and that's to acknowledge you for what you have done in your, in your position as CEO and the way you've opened up the lines of communications with the cities, and I can speak personally from Brookhaven as a, as a testament to that. That was a situation that did not exist before. It was an unhealthy situation. You have remedied that. Things have moved along phenomenally, and we, that's what this whole conversation is about here, having communications and an openness. So I do want to acknowledge you for that. Thank you very much. Well, thank We're you. very thank appreciative. You, well, um, Mayor Davis told me to say no comment. But I will comment, and uh, and this question is not a setup. Uh, Joe and I talked about this uh, last night, and I think it's an appropriate question to to be asked right now because, you know, so much of what it means to be a competitive community, a competitive city, or a competitive county has to do with your reputation, and if your reputation is tarnished, then uh, frankly, people don't want to come, businesses don't want to come. Uh, an opportunity, frankly, does not want to come to your community. Uh, and right now, we are not, to say the least, in a very competitive place in terms of our reputation. And so, frankly, I believe that that is um, not squarely, but primarily in the, in, in, in the realm of government, whether you're county government or city government, to make sure that we are operating um, as transparently, as honestly um, as we know how. And when we don't know how, get someone to help us to, to operate uh, in, in that manner. And a lot of it has to do not just in terms of individuals, just being honest and telling the truth, but it really has to do with establishing systems that can help facilitate greater transparency uh, and efficiency as well. And, and that's what we have to do. So much of what you've read in the newspaper and and I've seen on TV has to do with uh, what I say, and, and my friends up in the northern sector like when I say this, we've been doing a lot of trusting in DeKalb County, but not enough of oversight. And there was this politician that, that made a, a famous quote that said, trust but what? Verify. Verify. They all love, my Republican friends love when I say that. They say, I knew you were a Republican. Uh, <laughs> But I think that's what we have to do. You know, you trust that people are going to tell the truth, but you have to put systems in place to verify, to provide that kind of oversight. And until we get a grapple on that, and, and we've attempted, you know, as a county to put certain things in place, uh, and I'm proud of that, but we still have a, we still have a ways to go in terms of um, providing uh, that level of oversight that we feel confident you know, in, in, in building an environment that really generates the confidence that we are being open and honest and a very ethical uh, government. And I think, you know, right now DeKalb County is a 800-pound gorilla in the room or elephant in the room, but, you know, that goes across all of our local jurisdictions as well. Uh, and, and the greater we are able to do that, the more competitive we'll be um, in terms of economic development as well. And I'll close with this. I'm so excited that you all uh, are doing this, uh, focusing on the northern arc uh, and coming together. I don't know if this has ever been done before, but it's the first that I've seen uh, where, where the, the four north, the, the, the northern areas, uh, 
Dunwoody, Shambly, uh, Doraville, and who am I missing? Uh, Brookhaven. Oh, I'm square in. I'm so sorry. That's what happens when you, Rebecca, give me, have come together to, to, to communicate a, a, a combined vision uh, that will make us more, uh, uh, more competitive. And I think the more that we do that, not just in the northern arc, but in the southern arc, and that we do as a whole, um, I think the, the better we'll be positioned as a county. So thank you all for doing this. Thank you, Lee. Um, my challenge to the panel, to the, mostly the, the government officials, well, everybody, is the conversation on ethics needs to be loud and clear in our own establishments. We have to constantly, it's not a responsibility that falls just on uh, CEO Lee May here. It's all of us. It's a matter of challenging what we're doing daily with our people, the example that we're setting, and the integrity that we bring to the equation. It's something that, up to this point, I think people, people, take, people tend to think, oh, they'll do the right thing. And then when they don't, we kind of like say, well, where did the ball get dropped? So the onus is on us every day in our positions and responsibility to be thinking about where, what we're doing, the example that we're setting, and then make sure that we're, we're, we're leaders in this field of really improving, because it's all of us that have to do this. And if we don't get it handled, we're going to be handicapped from an economic development standpoint. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Todd. Thank you, Joe. Um, one of the things that I, I think that you might notice if you look around this room and definitely look at this panel is there's a lot of diversity in DeKalb County. I think DeKalb County really does have a tremendous amount of diversity that you're not going to get in a lot of major metropolitan areas. Um, you know, specifically to this particular part of DeKalb County, though, we are lacking in a real draw, right? James Tismanakis from the DeKalb County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thank you, James. Um, and we're looking for something of significance that people are going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go to insert any city here north of Cab. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to catch uh, a show, color purple. And then I'm going to stay at the Holiday Inn. And then I'm going to go out to eat at Terre Terroir or something like that. We are missing a big part of that. Okay, so if you think about that, you know, Manhattan has Lincoln Center. Uh, Chicago has Millennial Park. Midtown has Woodruff Arts Center. What do we have in Northern DeKalb? All right, we have pockets. So my question is to Dan Reuter from the Atlanta Regional Commission. They do actually have an arts, culture, and livability initiative. And my question is, um, you know, cultural hubs will create jobs. They complement tourism. Uh, they do stimulate economic growth. You know, what, what kind of advice could you give us that we could do here, or how could you help us to create that kind of cultural hub here in North DeKalb? Well, good afternoon, and, and, and thank you for inviting Atlanta Regional Commission here, and I think it's exciting that we're in here in North DeKalb, which is a very dynamic um, and, and a, a thriving uh, part of our region. Um, the question, I think, is a good one for not just North DeKalb, but Metro Atlanta in general, and that is that we do have these big hub um, kind of cultural facilities like the Woodruff Arts Center or like um, the Gwinnett Arena or something like that where they do dominate a lot of the, uh, the cultural events. But, but having said that, I would say that there's also a lot of small theaters um, around communities across uh, the metro area from Decatur to, I'm sure, around this area too. And there's other types of ways of engaging the communities. For example, um, one of the big events that just happened in the last month was Music Midtown. Um, I'm sure, or, or I'll tell you another one that probably nobody in this room knows about, but was called Tomorrow World, and was last weekend down in South Fulton. Well, both of those events brought in thousands and thousands of people, younger than me. Um, <laughs> Tomorrow World, I think, was, every, was people under 25, I don't know, but I've heard that people up in Douglas County could hear the music for three days. Um, but my point is, is that you don't necessarily have to have, you know, you, you need to have um, a way to bring people to a community and to have attractions and to draw, you know, to, to, to have some characteristics um, for your, the place that you're trying to define. And I think there is so many great, great um, assets here in North DeKalb, but I agree with you. There's not a facility like that. And there's, it's not the common place you would say, hey, let's all get together and go, go out um, to an event. In, in, in one of the places here. Although, again, I would say there's things that do happen in North DeKalb, like, for example, in the last year or so, I remember going to the air show at the airport at Peachtree DeKalb, or, 
or other um, events. But I think the opportunity here is places like the GM site in Doraville, which I know the, uh, the developers of that site are looking for great ideas for things that can land on that site. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, so switching it up a little bit, I'm going to propose this question to the mayors, if they could make comments. So if you can maybe pass the mic. Oh, Lee has the mic. But um, from a business perspective, you can grow your business two ways. You can do it by either acquiring other businesses, or you can do it from organic growth. You can create sales opportunities and, and grow your business that way. So if you look at the economic base of your cities, uh, there's an opportunity for you to acquire more space, more, more uh, commercial base, or you can grow it organically. So what are you doing in your city to grow your economic base organically? Oh. Go for it, Rebecca. Come on. Uh, actually, I want to uh, tag on that, this last answer about uh, creating events and reasons to come to your city. The city of Brookhaven is getting ready to plant about 400 cherry trees in the hopes of having the first of what will be many cherry blossom festivals in the spring, and we see that as a way to uh, have a big event that brings people into our city and enjoy, you know, one of our greatest assets, our trees. And is there any more beautiful place in the spring than Atlanta? So, and Brookhaven and all of our cities. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at the, the things that we as, a, as the smaller cities can do. Um, you know, Brookhaven is an interesting mix of businesses. While we've got, um, you know, big corporations like Cox and Auto Traders and Crawfords and at and I, I think our figures show that we have an awful lot of people working out of their houses and a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. And I think we've seen enough studies and demographics to know that really what we need to be focusing on is the incubators and promoting the entrepreneurialism. Uh, we have set aside a large space in our city hall for a business incubator. Uh, we haven't completely launched it yet, but Todd, you know that's on the drawing board, and that's kind of the direction we're going. So I think you, you know, we see that we have to work at both ends. We're going to support our good friends at Perimeter Summit, which uh, can build a few more high rises that they're that they're zoned for, and um, and fill them up with great corporations coming in. We've got to solve some of our problems of traffic and uh, density first, but we're very excited about promoting the small businesses and growing small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, I wish we could all be uh, Joe Gebbia's son and uh, have, you know, he's the one who's created this Airbnb, which doesn't own a single property, but um, he says don't say anything. But anyway, it's a, it's a wildly successful story and I, and I hope that that's the kind of atmosphere of entrepreneurialism and dynamism that we're creating. Thank you for that, and that was an amazing plug for the Cherry Blossom Festival. <laughs> Mayor Davis, I know you have a few things to contribute, but I'd like to ask you very specifically, I know we spoke with Mike Starling uh, about your business retention program that you have, which you don't really have a problem of losing businesses necessarily, but could you describe what that is all about? Uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to, but uh, before I do, let me just uh, throw two words out there, State Farm. Um, we're, they're building 2.2 million square feet in Dunwoody right now and uh, bringing in 10,000 employees. And uh, I have yet to have anybody tell me there's a bigger deal, office deal, in the history of Atlanta. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. So that's, that's what's going on. Uh, business retention. Uh, when I was first elected, I really wanted to be the ambassador to the, the businesses in Dunwoody. And specifically, to, to answer your question, it had to do with the fact that, you know, you never get the call from the company that, that chose somewhere else. No one calls you up and says, hey, I want to let you know you came in second. You never get that call. So the point is that I go out and meet with companies. We have 2,800 companies located in Dunwoody. And I've been meeting with the CEOs of all these companies since I was elected. This year I will visit with 250 of them, which is about one per day of... Um, of business days. So the whole point of this is I want to find out what's, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we can improve on, and I'm getting a lot of great ideas. A lot of, a lot of very interesting ideas come my way from talking to the CEOs and the managers of these companies. But the point is business retention, even though, as, as, as Todd says, no one's really leaving this area. The reality is that companies are here because they can attract 
the kind of employees they want from all four directions. So that's the good news. That's what I always hear. We love it here. We're not going anywhere. The bad news is traffic is not good. And we've got to figure out a way to solve that. Uh, we've got a few things going on, uh, as I'm sure Yvonne will tell you, about 425. That's great news. But we have a lot of traffic coming through this area, and, um, and we have to fix that. But the reality is no one's leaving this area because for a company to leave Dunwoody means that a third to a half of their employees are not going to be happy with whatever direction they chose. So they're all staying here, and we're thrilled with that. Thank you. Well, he used two words, and I'm going to use one, GM. So, <laughs> yes, two letters. So we are, uh, of course, very, very excited about this. This is exciting for Doraville as well as the surrounding cities and the whole region. And I think that we really need to um, work diligently and work very hard to bring in the businesses. We need to um, already appreciate what we have. Doraville has Buford Highway, which has some of the most wonderful diverse restaurants, then I know City of Shamley did a fantastic Taste of Shamley uh, last weekend, and Dorval is working toward doing something like that. With the GM property, we hope to have a town center. We hope to have a sense of being for everyone, a place to come that we can have um, events and enhance all the surrounding businesses. I, too, go out and talk to the business um, owners, the CEOs, and you hear a lot. No one is leaving. Everyone is really excited about State Farm, excited about GM, the property. So I think we just are working toward enhancing what we already have and enhancing working with uh, our surrounding cities and to build that culture. So it's, it's a very exciting time for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue to this theme of, eco of economic development that we're talking, and I'm going to direct it to the panel here. And there's very few tools that the state gives cities to actually go out and induce economic development. So, Vaughn, I'd like to start with you. I'd like to have your opinion about Redevelopment Powers Act and what you think of them, um, and if you think they're beneficial for cities to have. Well, uh, thanks, Joe, uh, for the question, and thanks to everyone for being here and for inviting the Development Authority to participate. Um, there are a number of broad things that we should keep in mind, uh, you know, because incentives and uh, different powers related to redevelopment are going to be very important to DeKalb County. Many of the places that we compete with across the United States and certainly here in Georgia are developing communities. So there's no infrastructure, the trees are being uh, t uh, torn down and new development is coming in. But DeKalb is really a redevelopment community because we have the advantage of the infrastructure the people, the resources that are already ingrained here. And so our economic development strategy and philosophy has to be different. Um, and so the Redevelopment Powers Act, as you uh, mentioned it, but also the whole philosophy of focusing on corridors and redeveloping those corridors so that they can enhance the ability for businesses to uh, find great sites and think about um, site selection in a different way uh, becomes very important. Um, we also have to not just focus on re, uh, the redevelopment of um, the specific real estate assets or sites uh, that are being looked at, but the philosophy of um, how we work together has to be redeveloped as well. Um, it's great that you all are talking about the Northern Arc instead of four separate cities and four separate strategies. The whole purpose of the economic development approach that we're taking at the Development Authority is the county has to be a part of itself. The big difference between family and friends, of course, is you don't really get to pick your family. You do get to pick your friends. And the thing that we have to remember here in DeKalb County is we're all family because we're right here in the same jurisdiction. And as we all benefit, um, every corner of the county benefits as well. Totally agree with that. Dan, would you like to chip in on this? I'd like to hear your opinion on the Redevelopment Powers Act. Well, well, the Redevelopment Powers Act um, is, is probably less used in, in, in our region in recent history versus other things like the CIDs. We've seen a lot of CIDs created in our region in the last 15 or so years. And those CIDs have been really good partners with local governments. They've brought in additional resources, particularly in DeKalb and Fulton, where we 
don't have the uh, availability of a SPLOST like they do in Gwinnett and Cobb where they can fund a lot of more infrastructure. But I would say in terms of this area of DeKalb, I look at what are the assets today. And Peachtree DeKalb Airport is one that Mayor Clarkson and I and, and others have talked about. The MARTA station that right there at the GM site, we need to make sure that GM site and the MARTA station is connected. Um, the, other, the other MARTA stations along the, um, and, and Buford Highway, I mean, well, well put that, you know, there's, there's a series of neighborhoods and then there's these, these commercial districts and, and, and corridors that really, those are the places we, we can put a lot of new investment. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to uh, ask a question of uh, Mary Helen McClanahan to discuss a little bit about, I was looking on their, the Georgia Department of Economic Development, and there are so many programs that they have. It's amazing. Uh, Mary Ellen, specifically, you're, you're, you're charged with small business and entrepreneurship, which we were talking earlier about how many uh, statistics are made up on the fly. 70%, does that sound about right? 74% of statistics are made up on the fly. But we, we, we said, Joe said something about 80% of the gross national product is made up of small business and entrepreneurs. Is that accurate? Maybe not. Okay, fair enough. Would you just talk a little bit about the programs that you have in place and how you might be able to help support small business and entrepreneurship here in the North Cab area? Thank you. Well, after you said that, Mayor, I'm going to cross off the stats I was just going to give. <laughs> Actually, about 99.8% of Georgia's businesses are considered small. That's just about everything. And I can't imagine that DeCab has a different number. So small is absolutely huge. And the department, while we are the sales and marketing arm for the state where we recruit business and industry and, and into Georgia, we sell Georgia to the world. But when it comes to small business, um, we, we focus on many things. One is to help communities build that, that enabling business environment. Um, having an ecosystem, Mayor, as you mentioned, having a, an incubator in your city hall. I'm going to write that down as one of my best practices, but, and I want to know more about it. But the, the, an, a, a, an enabling environment can take on many faces. Some can be costly, some can be just a commitment to the effort and cost little, but it, does, it goes so far when people are looking for resources. And to be the best go-to for a startup, for someone with an idea, for someone who's growing, is the best thing a community can do. Um, and the ecosystem needs to be local and it needs to be state. And, and one of the things I do is help communities build that environment. So call on me if I can help you. But the department specifically helps entrepreneurship and small business development in many areas um, through tax credits. Some of them could be an opportunity zone. Some of them might be eligible for other tax incentives and we'd be sure that they're aware of them. Our centers of innovation help with someone who has an idea and they need to take it to commercialization. So they get connected with R&D, with academia, prototyping, matching grants, those kinds of things, and industry expertise. Uh, tourism, export and trade, uh, film and entertainment, um, arts and music. As a matter of fact, the Arts uh, Council is housed in the department and they come into a community and can do a cultural assessment. If you want to use the arts as an economic development tool, that's what they do for you. We can identify Georgia suppliers. We have a database of Georgia manufacturers, so if you want to do business with Georgia companies, we can help you find those, those uh, suppliers and companies. And then lastly, as I mentioned, helping the local communities build that environment. That's what we do, and I'm here to help you. Thank you. Best way for people to get in touch with you specifically, just go on the website and send Very you an easy, email? Very easy, georgia.org. Click on small business awesome. and my photo and contact information is there. Lee, may I add a comment? Excellent. Yeah, let me, I just want to add in, um, Mary's boss, Commissioner Chris Carr, is a resident of Dunwoody. And, and I make that statement, Chris can't, you know, take any special provision for the city of Dunwoody or even DeKalb because we are DeKalb County, but it's something to building relationships, you know, with that, uh, with that department that is key. We found in DeKalb County, over, over, over the history uh, that we had not built strong relationships uh, with, with that department and with other state departments as well. And, and we realized we had to be more strategic in building relationships, understanding all the programs that are available, as Mary has labeled and uh, told us about a number of, of those as well. And I would just encourage you all, I don't know 
uh, in terms of the individual cities what you all's relationship is, but just to build those relationships has to be important, you know, because you never know when there's a major deal, a major company that's looking to come uh, somewhere in DeKalb County, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you know, kind of top of mind when, uh, when, when they're making decisions on who they want to send, you know, business to. That's what we're seeking to do in DeKalb County as a whole. Uh, and, you know, they'll come to DeKalb and they may not be looking for an unincorporated area. They may be looking for an incorporated. For me, that's still a win for us. It's a win when GM gets developed. It's a, it's a win when State Farm comes to Dunwoody. It's a win when CDC wants to expand their boundaries in Chambly, you know. Um, so, you know, those relationships are key. Thank you for your comments. We understand uh, one of our honored guests is here. So we might speed up things a little bit. Yeah. Joe, what do you want to do? Two more questions and we'll finish this up. So I'm going to ask Vaughn. I believe you coined the phrase that economic development is wet. That stands for water, education, transportation. I won't take credit for that. Who did it? I, I did say that. You did say that. I thought it was Doug, but you take the credit for it. So I believe our next question is related to education. Joe? All right, we've had uh, some questions submitted to us from some of the panel members here, and I'm going to direct it to, uh, to Doug. I mean, to uh, Mike Jacobs here. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you passed me the mic when I wasn't ready for it. Okay. What is the one legislative initiative that could make the greatest contribution to improving high school graduation and college matriculation rates within the state? Well, I mean, obviously we need to, you can't just pay attention to kids who are college bound. Um, and that is where a lot of our uh, efforts have been aimed at the state level in terms of retention. Um, you know, we have uh, some new industries, well, I mean, they're not so new anymore uh, that are um, that, that we're starting to see in the state of Georgia, for example, the, um, the, the film, you know, film and television industry, um, where, uh, you know, beginning to get uh, people trained uh, for those jobs is, is absolutely critical to the economy of the, of the state. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort, of, uh, that sort of technical education, vocational education, the more that we can further that at the state level and the more we can enable policies that do those things, um, the, the, the better off we're going to be in the long run, not just economically at the, you know, in terms of filling jobs that need to be filled here in the state of Georgia, but also in, in creating greater interest among students in the educational system and retaining those students all the way through graduation. That's really, the, I think, the, the most important thing uh, that we can do educationally to increase the graduation rate and also benefit um, uh, 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 the state from an economic development standpoint. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about education um, uh, both from both the lieutenant governor and the governor. So we're kind of like just breezing it over here, but it is an extremely important topic of conversation. They are so intricately connected. If you don't have the education in the workforce, you're going to stymie that economic development is such an important factor. I'm just going to ask one last question because I want to try and get full participation. Yvonne, it's coming to you. You've got a magic lantern. You can rub it and you can wish for anything that you want for the Northern Arc here. Share with us your vision of what you would ask for. <laughs> Governor Nathan Dill and our Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. We're going to be advancing the I-285-400 partnership, which is a, a goal of everyone sitting on this stage, from every government, from every endorsement, a project of need that's going to tie together major corporations, major population base, the center of the Atlanta region, connecting assets of MARTA, connecting uh, gateways to new corporate investment coming of 10,000 new jobs, so my magic genie would say, keep the drill, let's deliver, let's get this project into construction in 2016, which is the goal set by our governor and our lieutenant governor. Let's also have this project connect all the way up top in 285. The CID at Perimeter initiated a partnership 10 years ago 
to ask Cumberland CID to join us with an initial feasibility study of Top End 285, and that was to go from Cumberland, the perimeter, to Doraville with a major improvement system where you could put transit in that corridor and connect major employment centers from north, east, west. I can't think of a better vision than to take our current assets to build upon this agenda and begin to show a major evolution of newer projects attached to that agenda that connect economic opportunity. That is the Northern Arc, that is Sandy Springs, that is North Fulton. It's all part of the perimeter market at the center, which we reach across multiple jurisdictions, three cities, two counties, and many more opportunities for regional um, organization. So we've got an opportunity here. It's been, it's been designated. It is the highest pro surface pro transportation project in the state's history. It has funding. It has been declared by environmental approval just last week. That is a mo monumental achievement. We never have achieved uh, federal highway designation in that kind of record assessment. So I say stick with the team and this diversified team here, and let's build the project and make the connections. That's the genie. Thank you, Yvonne. <clears throat> That's excellent news to hear about that project moving forward. I'm going to pose the same question to the Chambers of Commerce, and I'm going to ask them this question. If, if you could ask your mayors or your city managers for one thing that they're doing, just something that they're doing that you know you could do a really good job at. What would you ask them for? I'll go first if you want, Marie. I would love to talk to you about the Convention of Visitors Bureau. Can we have lunch one day? Let's do it. See, it's easy as that. Go ahead, ask. There we go. Um, so I think this is an easy question but I'm still a baby in the chamber world, I think. I might be a little bit older than Lee, but I'm still a baby in the chamber world. I would say a better connected uh, DeKalb. I re would really love for us to be more engaged in the cities and how we do, um, how we collaborate together and how we look at our challenges, our, our issues, and how we tackle them collaboratively. Um, so I would say I would love for the chambers to get together and take that over and really work with the cities, engage the cities. And like we just said, you know, whatever is good for DeKalb is good for DeKalb. Whatever happens in our cities, um, it is good for DeKalb. We're one DeKalb. And so I would say to the chambers, and I challenge you all, um, let's get together and figure out how we make that happen. Would you like to comment? And I see Paula Owens, what? if you wouldn't, if you would, Paula, just hi. There's Paula, there, there's the real chief. Right. Uh, and that, this is actually something that we've talked about at the Dunwoody Chamber in terms of reaching out with what all these good ideas are. At every stage, if we don't engage the public, then too often there's public pushback because they are not aware of the benefits of the project, and perhaps too often they see the negatives from the project. So while we certainly like 10,000 new jobs coming with State Farm, one might ask a simple question, how will that affect traffic? What are we going to do about that? And I think we have a lot of good answers to show, you know, with the partnerships of the CID, the DOT, and all of us, that we can address this, but we're not doing the correct job, in my opinion, of reaching out to the public to help educate them and invite their opinion, and quite frankly, show a little bit of trust in them to give us opinions that can help guide us in making these decisions, not only from the NGOs that we all are, but really from our elected officials as well. And I know Mayor Davis and the city council, for example, has set up quarterly town hall meetings so they can engage the public about what the city is doing to help that education process. Because I'm too often in Dunwoody specifically, and I you know, point to that, we've seen good projects not move forward because the public hasn't understood them well enough to say that's okay. And so I think that's probably the best thing that we could do across the board in addition to working with each other but to help educate that public who gives us permission to do things. It's coming on here. Van, I know you're, you're brand new, right? You guys are 10 months old? Um, yeah, about nine, 10 months old. Um, you know, the interesting thing about Shambly is, I look at it as we're, we're ground zero. The rest of these cities surround us. And so what happens in the surrounding cities is gonna dramatically affect Shambly. 
um, we are very beneficial to have the second busiest airport in the state. And I think uh, any economic activity that we can drive out of that uh, airport is not only beneficial to Shambly, but also you know, Brookhaven, uh, Doraville, Dunwoody. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question, I think uh, a lot of times Shambly, which is, people forget, a 107-year-old city, um, has had a very sleepy mentality. We've felt like we were this small little town, and we, we need to, as a community and as government and as the chamber, realize we're in a big world now, and we need to start playing like we're in a big world. Thank you. Luke, come on, man. What do you want to ask Donna for for Christmas? I thought I, thought I was going to be able to get out of here without uh, having a speaking role. So um, uh, I'm not a chamber guy, so is that, is that your question? You're, you're still up there. You're, you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, so what was your question again? You <laughs> wasn't listening. I was going to say, what, what would you ask your mayor or your city manager for if you could ask him for anything? If there's one thing you could say, hey, let me handle that for you, I can do a really good job of that. Money. I mean, that's, you know, that's obviously what we need more than anything. Um, uh, but we, uh, you know, Dora, we've been, we've been in a bad spot. Um, resources are, are thin. Um, we've, we've gotten by through, uh, we talked about small business. Small business has really been our saving grace. Um, but really the people at the state, Yvonne over at PCID, we've really gotten to the point to where we are by forging partnerships. The, the county has, you know, always been helpful. Our neighboring cities, Shambly, Brookhaven, Dunwoody, we've always worked together. Uh, and the one thing that we have to understand is economic development cannot function in a silo. And if we're all competing against one another, if we're all working against uh, each other, then we're not going to be successful. Um, we have to look at Gwinnett County. We have to look at that, that, that model and uh, start thinking about how we can be more, um, more viable, and I think it's through, through unity. But, um, you know, aside from um, more money, uh, you know, infrastructure would be good. Um, but, again, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're getting everything we need, and we're getting it through help. So. Thank you very much. Great input. Thank you very, very much. We had a lot of questions. I think some of the answers went longer than... Uh, uh, we anticipated it. We also got a little bit later state, a uh, start rather. Um, but nevertheless, our first honored guest has arrived, uh, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. And I'm just going to read a quick introduction for him. And when he comes up, I'd like to have him be recognized. All right. So this is the basis. This is the, this is the bio. You ready? Successful entrepreneur, respected former state senator. Born and raised here, Hall County. Graduated Johnson High School, attended Gainesville College and Georgia Southern University. He had a sports injury when he was playing at Georgia Southern. It was the Achilles heel. I just got the, I just got the nitty gritty on that. And he returned back to Hall County to start his first business. So if that hadn't happened, he may not have followed the path that he did. But during his time as the state senator and later as lieutenant governor, he has provided a common sense private sector approach to state government, which is obviously what part of the conversation we're having by cutting billions of state spending and balancing Georgia's budget without raising taxes. He also sought to bring free market solutions to healthcare issues by advocating on behalf of community-supported safety net clinics, expanding immunity protections to doctors and nurses, and uh, championing meaningful tort reform to protect Georgians from frivolous lawsuits. As Lieutenant Governor, Casey has tirelessly works tirelessly to ensure all children, our biggest asset, in Georgia have access to a personalized educational environment. He launched the Georgia College and Career Academy Network, a partnership between local community leaders, school systems, Georgia's technical colleges. The College and Career Academies provide a relevant and rigorous curriculum aimed at preparing students for a highly skilled 21st century, 21st century workforce upon graduation. A key goal. Thanks to Casey's leadership, Georgia has 23 college and career academies today with additional academies planned every year. Recognizing Georgia faces an obesity epidemic, he launched the Lieutenant Governor's Healthy Kids Challenge, uh, and his goal was to get 50 Georgia schools um, in the Alliance for the Healthier Generation Healthy School Program within one year. 
Well, he achieved that in three months. And now the, the program is providing, is aimed to provide every Georgia student with access to an environment that encourages healthy lifestyle decisions. That's excellent. If we can do that, we'll really bring down the cost of healthcare. Notwithstanding his many accomplishments in private and public life, Casey is most proud to be a husband and a father. He has been married to Tanita, his high school sweetheart, for 26 years. I love that. And they are proud parents of three sons, Jared, Grant, and Carter. They live in Chestnut Mountain and are active members of the Blackshear Place Baptist Church. So please, welcome our honored guest, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, you're very, you're very nice. Uh, I know that you probably got tired of this other panel and just needed to stretch your legs a little bit. So uh, I appreciate uh, very much uh, being able to be with you today. And it's rare, actually, that I get to be somewhat um, on the panel uh, with the governor. And I know that he will follow me. So I guess I'm just simply the warm-up act. So hopefully I'll do a great job. But uh, it really is great to be with each of you. And thank you all for not only being here, but being uh, active and involved and uh, wanting to see the economy continue to improve and certainly your communities uh, thrive as well. Uh, I have uh, the good privilege of being with a lot of the elected officials, not only at the local level, but those that I serve with on a regular basis. Uh, my senator over here, Fran Millar, it's great to be with him and uh, the House members uh, also that are on the panel. Uh, uh, Representative Jacobs and, and others. So uh, um, they only gave me like five minutes, and then they said, you know, you'd have a lot of questions. But I do want to just frame a little bit of the discussion at the onset, if I might. Um, you know, back in, in, in the 70s, Birmingham and Atlanta were virtually the same size in population. There was very little difference between the two. But during that time, um, Atlanta took on the biggest investment of its day. It was in a place called Atlanta Hartsville Jackson Airport as we know today. It was a $500 million investment that was made. And today we celebrate the fact that it is the busiest airport in the world. Today there's really no comparison between Birmingham and Alabama unless we're talking football, of course, uh, or Birmingham and Georgia. Um, but the reality is what it teaches us is that we have to invest in order to grow. Every business that I've ever been involved in, I've never been able to cut my way to prosperity. I always had to grow my way to prosperity, and which means that you have to make strategic investments in order to allow that to exist. And it's about prioritizing what are the things that are really important. Back uh, early when Zell Miller was the governor, he said, I want to take this sleepy little port down in Savannah. And I want to turn it into a true economic engine for the state of Georgia. He said, my vision is very simple and very plain. He said, I'm going to go out and recruit the big box retailers, those that are big consumers of uh, imports that are coming to our state. And we're going to have them locate in the Savannah region. He says, because if we're successful in doing that, then those ships will have no other choice but to come to our port in Savannah. Today, it is the fastest growing port in the nation and creating $60 billion in general revenue each year and really being an economic engine for every part of our state and I would submit to you throughout the Southeast. These are wonderful assets that I just talked about. They're assets that someone had to plant a seed for and it had to be watered and nurtured. And today, each of us get to benefit from the harvest in which those seeds have, uh, have created. And it's up to us as leaders, uh, not only me as a lieutenant governor or the governor of the state, but all the elected leaders as well and community leaders to come together to ensure that we are creating the same kind of promise for tomorrow. And let me tell you what I think when it comes to economic development. It's certainly, we've got to recruit new industry to Georgia. We work very hard to make sure that we're a state that is very proactive and conducive for business to be done. And so we do have to recruit new industry, but we also have to take care of the existing industry that is in our state. 
But thirdly, of that three-legged stool, we have to make sure we're growing new industry. And I believe very strongly in the ability for entrepreneurs to be successful. And, and one of the ways in which uh, we've identified this year is uh, one of the problems that's existed. We've got great research institutions in our state uh, that are discovering new innovations that have a business application. And we incubate those, and they go on to be ready to be launched. But unfortunately, we identified over 30 of those companies that left Georgia to go somewhere else. And the reason is because businesses follow capital. They need venture capital. They need equity funding in order to grow. And with this great ecosystem that we have within our state, one of the major missing pieces to that is the venture capital presence. It doesn't exist here. Those companies went to Massachusetts. They went to California because that's where the v big VC capital firms are. That's why we launched Invest Georgia, which is committed to invest $100 million into a third-party fiduciary fund that would manage and attract private uh, uh, venture uh, capital firms here to Georgia and partnering with the investment the state is making, creating a pool of funds that would be a roughly $800 million. I believe it's a game changer. It's not only a game changer for this community, but it's a game changer for rural parts of our state as well. I visited with a small little company called Azalea Healthcare out of Alasta. They were discovered, incubated there out of Alasta State. It's a health IT company. And they located in downtown, they took a building, they are employing people, they're growing, they have revenue, but they need that round of funding, that equity funding to go to the next level. And they couldn't get it here in the state, but they wanted to stay. I want to make sure that Azalea Healthcare continues to be able to stay in Valdosta, Georgia, grow their company, and be the net success story within our state. But bringing it full circle, Economic development, every CEO that I sit down and talk with, all of them want to talk about incentives. That's a key part of the ingredients of making their decisions. But I will tell you, it quickly moves away from what are the incentives to the most important issue that they face, and that is workforce development. That is the key on every business owner's mind. No matter whether you're large or small, every business can only succeed with a quality workforce. And I believe that that is the greatest challenge by which we face. When you survey across America and you survey in Georgia, every company will tell you, we have jobs, but we don't have the qualified workforce to fill those jobs. You see, there's a real paradigm unfortunately, that exists within our state and within our country, I would submit to you. And that is that we have built an a, a K through 12 educational system around what I call a one-size-fits-all model. It says that every kid needs to go and get a bachelor's arts degree. And all the curriculums that are designed are designed in order for that to occur. Now, I will submit to you as a father of three boys that my boys are motivated and challenged in different ways. Communities are very different. The community that we uh, sit in right now is very different than Valdosta. It's very different than Albany. It's very different even to White County and others. And what I believe very strongly is that we need to get out of the one-size-fits-all model. And we need to allow local communities to design an educational curriculum that meets the needs of not only the community, but more importantly, meets the needs of the individual students. That gives real flexibility. That gives them the opportunity to write a five-year strategic plan of what they want to create as it relates to education and give them the flexibility and the opportunity to achieve it. For too long, Atlanta has told local schools how many teachers are going to be in a classroom and how many educational hours are going to be spent on a particular subject. And I don't think that that's the right formula for success. It certainly has not yielded the success that we want. That's why I introduced the charter system idea where all the entire system, the entire school system can convert to a contractual agreement with the state and have that kind of flexibility, giving us real innovation and giving us outcomes that all of us can be proud of. The second thing that is so important is the College and Career Academy initiative that I started. 
And what we've done today is we've created 29 of those across the state. What is so beautiful about it is it recognizes that this one-size-fits-all model does not work. And so as a result, we've taken a technical college and a traditional high school, blended them together, and we teach kids on a technical path of learning where every kid can either leave there with an industry certified certificate or they can leave there with college credits or an associate's degree. I visited with a young lady in Athens through the College and Career Academy, and this young lady who was an African-American was uh, working at Burger King part-time. So I don't know what her background is, but just to note, she was working at Burger King. She came up to me and she says, I am enrolled here at our College and Career Academy, and I want to be a lawyer. I am studying criminal justice degree, and when I graduate from school this year, I will not only graduate with a high school diploma, I will also graduate with an associate's degree in criminal justice. Now, what is amazing about that story is I want you to think about this for just a moment. This young lady is going to have an associate's degree out of high school, and she's not going to have any debt. What a head start. What an opportunity we're giving individuals by creating these types of pathways. That's what it's about. I visited with a lady not, not long ago, and she said, well, one of my students or one of my uh, um, children is great. They're getting an Ivy League education and, and, and had a scholarship and did so well in school. But she says, now my son, he struggles and he's not doing very well. And, and, and I quickly asked this question. I said, if you need a doctor, if you need a doctor today, that doctor is very valuable that comes to your aid. She said, absolutely. I said, but if you go home today and you find that a pipe has burst and water is spewing all over your home, that plumber is just as valuable to you today as that doctor was yesterday. Why do I say that? I say that because we as a society have to understand that everyone can find value, that everyone can find a job that is fulfilling and that meets their needs. And what we as leaders need to be focused on is building that kind of workforce because just like the visionaries that came before us that thought that if we can build that airport, if we can take this port and make it into something Huge benefits will be reaped in the future. I submit to you today that if we will build the workforce that we need today to compete in a 21st century economy, we won't have to worry about economic development because not only are businesses going to be seeking to be here, but businesses that exist will be expanding because they have the quality workforce that they need and the entrepreneurial spirit will be alive and well because that ecosystem is fulfilled. I believe that is our greatest challenge that exists within our time today. That's why by 2020, I want a college and career academy, every kid to have access to a college and career academy in this state. That's how much I believe in it. And I'm telling you, if we can close this gap, the skills gap that exists, and we can accelerate students, giving them real focus and guidance and opportunities today, we will all reap a marvelous harvest for the future. So thank you all very, very much for giving me just a chance to um, set the context. And I probably went way over my time, but I think I'm supposed to answer some questions now. Okay? Well, that was right on target with what we were talking about. Oh, good. Very, very, very well put. Thank you for your perspective on that. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I've asked the panel to submit questions, and they will direct it to you. Um, this one comes from... I hope it doesn't come from Doug. That would not... Doug's song, that would not be good. <laughs> I'm teasing. Doug, where are you? <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Doug's my, my friend. Right. He's my friend. Uh, this is from uh, Mayor Pittman of Doraville. Mm -hmm. 
Community's investment in infrastructure is critical to economic development. Of course, we've just talked about that. What are some of the things the state can do to help cities generate revenue to make these investments? Well, as a, one, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, it's, it's not a, really a function of, you know, what can the state do, but, you know, it's, it's a combination of all of us working hand in hand. Uh, it's working in a collaborative uh, direction uh, in, in really in a regional context uh, to, to make sure uh, that uh, we do have the kind of growth, uh, not only residential growth, but also uh, the, the the industrial and commercial growth that 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 obviously allows revenue to be generated for the infrastructure items that are so desperately needed. Uh, in a broader context, I will tell you that we we do have a, a very large shortage of funding as it relates to infrastructure. Uh, we have a state uh, department of transportation today that is uh, vastly underfunded as it relates to the real needs that we have. And I think that there has to be a very serious dialogue in which we have a study committee that's going forward to address those, uh, those concerns, looking at alternative funding sources for the transportation needs of our state. And certainly it is a function of building new capacity. Uh, but also taking the existing capacity in which we have and utilizing it in the most efficient manner. I've been a huge proponent of reversible lanes, uh, which is a great tool to manage the flow of traffic when you need it, um, which, is very crit uh, which is very critical to our long-term success. Along with uh, transit, transit is a very large piece of uh, of the issue that needs to be solved for our state. I think that MARTA can be rebranded and retransformed in a way uh, that really does give commuters viable options that allow them to choose that form of transportation opposed to a car. And uh, with uh, this, this legislative session, hopefully we'll be able to address that along with the funding needs for transportation. But the bottom line is when more people are employed and we have more taxpayers and businesses are thriving, uh, then the revenue growth for not only the state but for uh, cities and counties continue to grow. And uh, I, I just might add, as a side note, and, and this uh, may become uh, somewhat controversial, but um, just to, to point it out, Georgia is the lowest tax state in the country as it relates to state taxes. When you put the local taxation burden on to that equation, then obviously we go much higher. Um, and so it is very important when we talk about whatever the funding sources are that we ensure that we remain very competitive in a national environment because businesses do engage in, in, uh, in the overall uh, vantage point of taxation as they're making those decisions. It's not the single largest de determining factor, but it is one. Thank you. Um, second question here is about charter schools uh -huh. and uh, several key bills which would have improved the charter school environment in Georgia passed the House of Representatives last year but failed in the Senate. Uh -huh. Can you give us any kind of encouragement about what will happen this year? Well, um, what I can tell you is that, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I am a huge proponent of, of charter schools. Um, what I identified as my initiative charter systems is something that's very different than a charter school. A charter school is, uh, is an entity by which is authorized either by the local school board um, to, to open up under an, an independent arm uh, that is governed by parents and administrators and things of this nature. Um, and the question becomes a, an issue of funding of those charter schools. And um, the, the, we have been very proactive in allowing additional state funds to come forward. It has been controversial at the local level um, because oftentimes you do have certain counties that are not willing to allow, um, uh, you know, an external independent type charter school to come in. And uh, we have um, authorized alternative authorizing uh, or authorization for that. Uh, to happen. So, um, you know, specifically, uh, you know, we, 
We certainly need to always be mindful that public education is the great equalizer. It's the great equalizer. No matter where you come from, no matter what your circumstances, education is that ability for someone to gain the knowledge and the tools to be successful in life. And we cannot turn our backs on public education. It is something that I feel that passionate about. That's why I want reform. That's why I believe in the initiatives that I've put forward. And we can improve, and we've demonstrated that. This uh, last question, um, I really want you to think about before you answer, because this is going to be a this doozy. You ready? Was it good for Georgia, Georgia Southern to join the NCAA, Title I? It dang right it was. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, um, you don't want me to get uh, on, a, on that, that path. But I will tell you that, um, you know, to a larger, uh, in a larger context, uh, uh, I'm very, very proud of Georgia Southern. Uh, not only their football program that uh, has been very, very competitive and they've, they've aimed very high, um, but, you know, th those are the things that all of us strive to do. I mean, it, it's, it, it's easy to oftentimes be average. It's sometimes easy to be good. But we don't strive to be good in Georgia. We strive to be great. And, you know, that's what each of us should wake up every single day and be focused on doing. As a lieutenant governor, I mean, I sit in awe and on a regular basis thinking of the platform that I have, the opportunities that are before us, and the problems that we have, and how I can bring meaningful solutions to bear. It's exciting, and, and, and it's not that we want to just settle, that we want to just be okay. That's not what defines Georgia. Georgia is the capital of the South. No one else truly compares to the greatness that we have. But we have to always re be reminded that we are just as good as yesterday, all right? And, 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 and you know, we've got to continue to ra raise the bar each and every day. And even though we're building a lot of new infrastructure today, that infrastructure, we're already behind tomorrow, okay? And so our focus has to continue. And so I'm excited about the opportunity that's ahead, uh, not only for the state, but, uh, but also for Georgia Southern. So thank you very Excellent. much. Yeah. Please, a nice round of applause right. for our Lieutenant Governor, Tracy Kegel. We really appreciate your service. Thanks, Tracy. I know you have another bunch of get to. Thank you, sir. We're going to just take a two-minute break. I'll ask that the panel stay uh, on stage, uh, unless you need to take a break. That's fine. Our second um, honored guest has arrived, and uh, we have a little pump and circumstance that we're going to present here. So we'll take just a minute. I, I would invite everyone to try some of the food in the back. Anyone that has had any, it's fantastic, and there's plenty. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Casey? To present our colors today, we have the Cross Keys High School Navy JROTC Color Guard under the command of Cadet Rodriguez. Before we present colors, I'm going to ask every veteran to raise his hand. All right, I want you to look around. These are the people that make the words we say valid. When we send, say the last part of our pledge, with liberty and justice for all, these are the people, and there's hundreds of thousands of them all around the world. We need to be thinking about the meaning of those words when we say it and not just say it. Present colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies for amber waves of grain for purple 
Oh, mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea oh beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life America America may God thy gold refine till all success be no and every gain divine, oh beautiful, for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster city's gleam. Undimmed by human tears, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with bright. From sea to shining Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, please be seated. I have the expanded version of an introduction here for Governor Deal, but I'm going to go to a shortened version because he has another event to go to. So we want to make sure we have time to enjoy his comments as they relate to our economic symposium here. Um, I've gotten to meet the governor on several occasions, and the first thing I always have to say is, the wind beneath his wings is not here today. And she is the first lady, Sandra Deal, who, when she's with the governor, obviously lights the place up. And we so enjoy her company. Do let her know that we miss her here. And uh, we wish she could have been. I'm sure she's also very busy at this time. Well, I'm not gonna even going to take away probably a lot of the things the governor is going to say and give it away. Some of the key points is um, under his leadership here now, Georgia has risen to become the number one place in the nation to do business. And that's what we're talking about. This is a phenomenal accomplishment. We need to keep this momentum going. Um, this was achieved by creating a competitive initiative by creating the competitive initiative, reforming our tax code, emphasizing education, and actively recruiting businesses to Georgia. 
As Georgia's 82nd governor since January 2011, he has cut taxes, eliminated state agencies, reduced the state workforce. He saved hope from the brink of uh, bankruptcy, and in my opinion, displayed a very bold action in order to prevent the Cab County school system from losing its accreditation. For that, we are sincerely appreciative. It has a lot to do with the values of our homes here and our economic development, very important. Champion education innovation, and this next one I know he's very proud of, as he implemented significant cost-saving reforms in our, in our criminal justice system, and I'm sure you'll touch on that. He fought to increase safety of our public waterways, improved our workforce by aiding veterans and technical college students, and enacted stricter rules on lobbying to boost public trust. The governor has prioritized education and child safety. Regarding education, he increased K-12 spending by more than a half a billion dollars, the largest increase in education in seven years. And regarding child safety, he started a three-year plan to add nearly 500 new welfare caseworkers to DFACS. Lord knows they could use it. An, additional, an addition sorely needed as we work to protect our greatest asset, which is our children. He's a native of Sandersville, as a native of Sandersville. Governor Deal earned his law degree from Mercer University, served in the U.S. Army at Fort Gordon in Augusta, before finally starting his own law, law practice in Gainesville, uh, the, which was the hometown of his uh, dear wife, Sandra. Did you meet her there when you did that? Well, you. Nope. <laughs> hey, we should share, share stories. I <laughs> Uh, while his wife taught in the Hall County um, school system, the governor began what would become a 40 year what would become 40 years of community service, holding positions as prosecutor, judge, state senator, and then 17 years as a United States congressman, where he rose to the, the chair of the Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce. It is here they became a noted expert on entitlement reform and health care policy. Okay, and the last tidbit on the governor and the first lady. They've been married for 47 years, is that correct? 48. 48, okay, you, you opted another year. She renewed your contract. <laughs> Very good. They have uh, four children, and this is the part that I'm most envious of. Uh, they have the joy of spoiling six grandchildren, so I'm, I'm really envious of that one. Congratulations to you. Please join with me in giving a warm welcome to our honored guest, Governor Nathan Deal. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate the introduction and distinguished platform guest. Good to see all of you. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Today is a very important day, I believe, in the history of our state. We had the signing ceremony for the deepening of the Port of Savannah. This is something... <laughs> this is something that we have been awaiting for 15 years. Uh, back in 1999, the Congress passed uh, legislation that authorized the deepening of the Port of Savannah. Uh, it set a number that became very obviously inefficient, insufficient number as to the upper appropriation limit that uh, this project could uh, have. Uh, since that time, we have seen the escalation of the cost estimate for that project uh, go to where it currently has been embodied in the latest uh, revision of that original statute uh, to reflect $706 million uh, as the cost of this project. Now, it is a joint funding mechanism between the state of Georgia and the United States government. Uh, the cer signing ceremony today uh, was a contractual agreement to authorize the beginning of this project it was entered into by the Ports Authority of, of Georgia, uh, the Department of Transportation of Georgia, and by the U.S. Corps of Engineers of the United States Army. So with that document being signed today, uh, we are now allowed to proceed, and I, I see we have several members of our legislative delegation from your county who are here today, and uh, I want to thank them because they have cooperated in this project they have continued to add money in our state bond package so that we now have $266 million of state money that is set aside as our share for that project. Now, the reason that is so significant is this. That's the money we're going to have to use to get started, and that's perfectly fine. 
Uh, I told them a long time ago that if you will just give us the go-ahead, we are ready and willing to start spending state dollars so we don't have to wait any longer. We uh, can't afford to wait any longer, quite frankly. This is a three to three and a half year project, and the new Panama Canal, even though it is behind schedule, uh, is still probably going to be completed before we complete the dredging of the entire harbor. It is a very long dredging project. It's somewhere between 33 and 42 miles in length. We have to start out in the ocean because they're so big that they have to have uh, some capacity as they enter the mouth of the Savannah River. And then once they get in the Savannah River to deepen it by about five feet for the rest of that remaining length of the Savannah River until you get to the port, which is in the Garden City area. So it is an important project. Uh, it has been for a very long time and certainly continues to be one of the key ingredients to the economic success of our state. And because people do recognize that, uh, we have had virtually the unanimous support of the members of the General Assembly, no matter what part of the state of Georgia they represent, because it's pretty easy to show that the port has a positive financial impact on every county in this state. So we are pleased that people have embraced the project at the state level and that uh, the Congress has also embraced that. Uh, as Senator Chambliss mentioned today in his comments, uh, we had the unanimous consent of our congressional delegation. They all signed off on the project and worked to make sure it was completed in terms of the revision of the authorized spending limit, which is not easy to do. You know, you would think you could just go in and amend the number. It's not that simple in Washington. Things that seem simple sometimes are very, very complicated and take a long period of time. But we got it done today. We're going to get started, and uh, we are looking forward to the completion of that project. Now, that's today's news. Let me sort of bring you up to speed as to where we are in this state. We continue to be a state that is growing. We were the 10th largest population state when I was elected governor and took office in 2011. We are now the eighth largest state in the country. Uh, we have grown significantly. We have left North Carolina that was our closest uh, number competitor back in 2010. We were 10 and they were 11 and now we've jumped over Michigan and we've gone to eight and North Carolina's gone to 10. So we've had a lot of people moving into our state. That's not just uh, domestic growth. It is really migration of people into our state. And part of the reason for that is that we have seen job growth, significant, significantly greater job growth in our state than in many others, especially some of the ones who surround us. And that's good for us because that causes the revenue of the state to increase. In fact, uh, we conservatively budget and have done so for quite a while, the end of the fiscal year 2014, which ended in June, the state revenue came in at 5.17% above the same period of time for fiscal year 13. There are very few states in this country that can show that kind of economic growth in state revenue, unless, of course, they have oil or gas, which uh, some of our competitor states out west have the good fortune of having that. But we believe that uh, thanks to the help of the General Assembly, that by keeping our budgets conservative, we have maintained a AAA bond rating. And um, I used to be able to say we were one of only nine states. Now I have to say we're one of only 10 states. So for those of you who have friends in Texas who think they're always bigger and better and ahead of everybody else, congratulate them. They finally got a AAA bond rating something we've had now for quite a while. But it does save us millions of dollars in, in interest over the period in the life of bonds that are issued by our state. And uh, we're just pleased that we have that kind of significant growth. Now, there are some dynamics that are taking place in this state, and that is that because of the job growth that we have seen, we are certainly finding that we lack the workforce to fill some of the jobs that are currently available in our state. And that's certainly something that none of us want to see. 
We don't want to see companies have to import people into Georgia just to have the skills that they need to make their company successful. So over the last two years, thanks again to the assistance and cooperation of the General Assembly members, we have identified seven areas where jobs exist, not enough people to fill them, and we have designated that if someone will go to our technical colleges and get a degree in those areas, one of those areas, then we will pay 100% of their tuition in our technical colleges. I believe that is the best way to incentivize people to go into jobs, into areas where jobs currently exist. Let me tell you just a few of those categories, and I think some of you will readily recognize uh, that they are areas we need some additional workers. Uh, one is just one that sounds like it would be simple, and that is uh, commercial driver's licenses. Uh, if we have a shortage now of people with CDLs, then just think what our problem could be when the port is deepened and those super post Panamax vessels come in with those large amounts of containers that are on one vessel. So we have the capacity to train them in our technical colleges, and we're trying to incentivize them to go back and get those kind of skills. Welding. We are a state that is now uh, invested very heavily in increasing manufacturing. And that was done through tax reform, the biggest portion of it being to remove the sales tax on energy that is used for manufacturing. And that has stimulated manufacturing job growth in our state. And many of those that are especially in the fabrication area, they need good welders. And we have a shortage of good welders. In fact, when JCB, which is an English-based company that has its primary operation in Savannah, wanted to expand their operation and add a third line, they could not find enough qualified welders in Georgia. They had to go to Jacksonville and hire welders. Well, that's not good for us. We need to have our own people that are trained and able to take those kind of jobs. Uh, diesel mechanics don't have enough qualified diesel mechanics. Health technology information technology, early childhood education. Uh, those are just a few of those seven areas. But I've come up with some more that I'm going to recommend to the General Assembly next year be added to that list. I've been saying I had four. I'm about to be convinced that we maybe need five. And the fifth one would be in the area of construction. Now that seems a little bit ironic in light of the fact that that's the portion of our society that got hit the hardest with the downturn in the Great Recession. Many people lost millions and millions of dollars that were in the construction business, whether they be developing subdivisions, building houses, building commercial buildings, because when it stopped, it stopped dead in its tracks. And it hit our state very hard because we were growing so fast. But now, I am hearing from more and more people in the uh, construction arena that they cannot find enough qualified people to do basic construction. And if that's the case, we have the capacity to train them in those skills at our technical colleges. And there again, I believe it might be one of those areas that the General Assembly might wish to consider next year to incentivize training in that area. But the four that I have definitely identified are these. Two of them relate to manufacturing. Precision manufacturing, that's becoming more and more of a skill area that we need additional help. One is what you might just call assistant engineers. That's the kind of folks who can keep the equipment and the machines running inside of manufacturing facilities. Our workforce there is getting older, and as those individuals retire, we need to be sure we have enough qualified younger folks who have the skills to go in and assist in making those machines continue to run. Um, those are not quite as exciting, though interesting, perhaps, as the next two. One of them is in the area that some of you have already mentioned to me here today, and that is in the film industry. Georgia is now the third-ranked state in the country in terms of film production. <clears throat> we are only behind California and New York. And California is extremely worried. If you've been keeping up with the news on that one, several weeks ago, the governor of California signed a piece of legislation that the General Assembly there had passed to increase their tax credits because 
these people have left California and they're coming to Georgia. Now, to quote, uh, to quote people who are knowledgeable in the business, that's not going to stop the migration out of California. And uh, that's been good for our state. We are seeing a permanency associated with the film industry. You know, at the beginning of the film industry, it used to be, well, they'd haul people in here, they'd shoot a film, and then they all go home. Well, that's not happening anymore. There's more permanency. People are building sound stages all in, the, in every part of our state. And uh, that's the kind of multi-million dollar investments that are not necessarily going to pick up and go anywhere because it's physically impossible to do so. The biggest has been Pinewood Studios, which are out of London, England. Uh, they decided, to, now two years ago, I guess it was, that uh, they were coming to Georgia, which is the first time I'm told that they have ha ever had a sound stage outside of the United Kingdom. And when they decided to leave and produce another uh, sound stage operation, they came to Fayette County, Georgia. And they are in the process of building, I used to think it was somewhere around 30. I had a meeting the other day in which their people said, no, we're shooting for 35. And uh, they are leasing these sound stages just as fast as they get them built. And that's good for them and uh, certainly is good for our state. But as we have seen that film industry grow, we are now hearing from them that they cannot find the kind of workers that they need to make the films possible to be produced here. There again, they have imported people in in the early stages, in the early years, and many of the ones who do that have now migrated and established their own small businesses to provide sound, lighting, uh, construction for scenery, etc. But there's still a shortage. And that's something that we can fill if we train our people to have the skills that they need. We've already had a cooperative effort actually uh, associated with Pinewood in which uh, Georgia Southern University and Georgia State, working with some of our technical colleges in the area, are already doing uh, initial work of training individuals to have the skills that are needed in the film industry. Having an association close to a major operation like that will give students hands-on experience by being able to work on the sets. Now, the fourth one is probably even a little more different. It's, uh, it's certainly out of the ordinary. A little less than a year ago, I had a young fellow who came up to me, and he's a young fellow by my standards, but uh, he's been a very successful entrepreneur, multimillionaire. And he asked me this question. He said, Governor, have you ever considered giving high school students credit as a foreign language if they will use, if they will learn the language of computing. I said, no, I never thought about that. He said, well, you know it is a foreign language. I said, well, it would be a foreign language to me, that's for sure. We have taken his idea, and we believe it has great merit. We made an announcement several weeks ago, and we were actually made the announcement on the campus of Georgia Tech in a building that he is, that is named after him because he's given the money to build the facility, Christopher Klaus. And he is a very successful entrepreneur and someone that I think is creative and has the right ideas. Now, being at Georgia Tech for that announcement, I learned from uh, the authorities there at Tech that computer programming degrees at Georgia Tech have the highest placement rate and the highest starting salary of any degree program that they offer. But now, not everybody needs to go to a university such as Georgia Tech or the University of Georgia to have the kind of skills that they can, mar that they can market and that are in the marketplace. Two-thirds of the jobs in computer programming, we are told, are not in the high IT area. They are in ordinary businesses who need internal programmers for their companies in order to keep their company uh, on track with the 21st century. We can train individuals in our technical colleges to have those kind of computer programming skills. We are also working with our Board of Regents so that if an individual gets those kinds of credits for which they will be given credit, I believe the state school board is before the beginning of next school year going to announce that they will accept that. 
the Board of Regents and our, tech, and our high, higher education institutions, uh, we need to be sure that they will accept that as uh, admission requirements into our colleges and universities. We have every reason to believe that they, too, are going to agree to do that. Now, I am told that if we are able to, to achieve that, we will be the only state in the country that has taken that very forward-looking step. And that, of course, will give us greater prestige in terms of attracting companies who need those kind of computer programming skills because they are desperately looking now. And if we are producing a steady stream of young people who have those talents, that will enhance the opportunities for all of us in our state. And I think in a metropolitan area such as where you are, uh, that offers great promise because you are in the portion of Metro Atlanta where companies want their headquarters to be, where they want their IT companies to be. We continue to see those kind of, of developments coming to this North Metro area region. So if we have a steady a stream of qualified individuals to fill those kind of jobs, I think it puts us very high on the selection list when companies decide if they're going to relocate, where should they go? Well, those are just a few of the things that uh, are going on. Uh, we are continuing to work in a number of areas that we've already initiated, and I'll hit these very briefly, and I'll try to leave a little time for Joe to ask me some questions or for you to ask me some questions. There's an area that didn't get a lot of attention, but I think it will get a lot of attention in the very near future. And that is something that the General Assembly has been very cooperative with me on. And that is the reform of our criminal justice system. We have neglected that in this state for a very, very long time. The result was that we had taken the attitude that everybody who violates the law, uh, send them to prison, lock them up, give them a sentence, throw away the key and forget about it. And everything's going to be all right with the world. Well, the result of that was that, as I indicated, we were the 10th largest population state when I took office, but we had the fourth highest population in our prison system. I sort of jokingly say I don't think we're that much meaner than the people in all the other states in this country, but we were taking that attitude and it produced those kind of statistics. So we decided, well, what do we do about it? You don't just talk about a problem unless you've got a solution for it. We did a survey. And we asked people in that entire arena of criminal justice, what do you think we need to do? And the answer came back, well, if you'll look at it, you are incarcerating in $18,000 a year prison beds people who by your own definition are classified as nonviolent. That just doesn't quite seem to be uh, logical, does it? So we knew there were alternatives to that. They're generally referred to as accountability courts. Those are drug courts, DUI courts, increasingly mental health courts, and most recently, veterans courts. General Assembly this past session authorized the creation of veterans courts as a part of our accountability court system. We are told we will have 60 to 80,000 veterans returning to Georgia within a three-year period. Many of them will bring problems associated with their service to our country and it is more appropriate to be able to deal with those problems in a court that is dedicated to veterans because you can access the resources from our Veterans Administration and provide help and assistance to them that is uniquely available to that population group. Now, what effect has that had? That was the first year. That was the first step. And by the way, I was told that this was a politically controversial issue, especially for a Republican governor to take on. Well, thanks to the fact that uh, many of you helped us in this undertaking and the General Assembly was so willing to be a part of this process, we passed that first piece of legislation unanimously. And as these gentlemen can tell you here on the diocese, that passing anything unanimously in the General Assembly is not something that is achieved easily. But I believe the case was made and they did pass it unanimously. Let me tell you what the short-term results of that have been. In the first quarter of this year, we have had 4,100 Georgians who are in accountability courts, and now we are up to 105 of those scattered around our state because we have increased funding for accountability courts in order to create more, create more of them. Almost without exception, that 4,100 individuals 
would have in the past wound up in our state prison system in those expensive beds. The result of doing that is this. When I came into office and in 2011, we were spending over $25 million a year paying local sheriffs to keep state prisoners because we didn't have any room to put them anywhere. We couldn't pick them up because we didn't have anywhere to place them. From 25 plus million dollars in 2011, at the end of fiscal year 2014, which ended in June of this year, that number was down to just slightly over $40,000. That is a savings of over $24 million on just that one element alone. It has reduced the jail backlog by over 90%, and very quickly, I'm told, we will be in a posture where we won't be paying local governments to keep prisoners because we will be picking them up in a timely fashion. Now, that's the first year. The second year, we took on juvenile reform. And if you think $18,000 for an adult bed is expensive, try about $90,000 for a juvenile to be incarcerated in an RYDC or a YDC for a year. We have to do so many more things for them. So we use the same approach. We created programs and money to make available to counties in our state who would create local community-based diversion programs. Now in both of these situations, these apply only to those who are classified as nonviolent. That's the appropriate place where we think we can deal with these individuals more effectively. Uh, we believe we will continue to see the same positive results in the juvenile arena as we've seen in the adult arena. Now, you, you have to recognize that most of these people who are classified as nonviolent but who are in trouble with the law have a substance abuse problem of one sort or the other, alcohol, drugs, legal or illegal drugs and not dealing with the problem that caused them to get in trouble and just simply ignoring it and hoping it's going to cure itself has never produced very good results. So we believe that in both the juvenile and the adult population, we're going to see significant changes of directions. Now, once again, thanks to the cooperation of the General Assembly, the second year it was passed unanimously. Now, this year was the third leg of the criminal justice reform stool. And that was what we call transition support and reentry, And that is dealing with those inmates in our state prison system who at some point in their time are going to be released. Almost all of them at some point in time are going to come back. And when they come back, the pattern is they go back to the community in which they got in trouble in the first place. So we're not doing too good a job over the last long period of time. Our recidivism rate has been almost one out of every three that is released is back in our prison system in three years or less. That's the proverbial revolving door. So we asked the question there, well, how do we stop that? We did a survey of the inmate population, and we found that almost 70% dropped out of school. They don't have a high school diploma, and they don't have a GED. Now, if you don't have those basic education skills, and you've got a major felony on your record, and your time has been served, and we pat you on the back and send you out the door and say, okay, don't get in trouble again, huh. it's a wonder we don't have more than one out of every three getting in trouble in three years. So we've decided to do something about it. We have hired one of the best school superintendents in our state. Some of you may know him. His name is Buster Evans. He has been the school superintendent until recently. Uh, for Scythe County Schools, and he is now an assistant commissioner in the Department of Corrections. He is charged with education and training, and we are going to make a difference. We believe if we can give individuals who are coming out of our system a marketable skill, they will have a much higher rate of success in not getting in trouble, and that's what we want. We don't want them coming back. Because if they get in trouble again, you can call it by a big fancy word like recidivism, but what it means is they have committed another crime and there are more victims. And that's not good for any of us. It doesn't keep us safer by any means. So uh, we're going to make a concerted effort in that regard. I was down just a few days ago down in Fort Valley at the Blue Bus, uh, Bluebird Bus Company. Uh, they are one of the larger, if not the largest, bus manufacturer in the country. And we have used their services in our Department of Corrections. They make the buses that we transport prisoners on. 
and we were there. Uh, they, we were seeing their assembly line, and they said this to us. They said, we are growing, and we need good welders. If you will train inmates to be good welders, we will guarantee them a job when they're released. Now, that is the kind of positive I, statement I think we're going to see from businesses all around this state, and that will make a huge difference, not just in the life of that individual. It will make a difference in the life of that individual's family unit. It will be where no longer is it acceptable for daddy or, or uncle or aunt or mother to be incarcerated and be in and out of our jails and our prisons. We'll give them a different view of life, and that way they can support their families and they can be law-abiding citizens and not get in trouble. Now, I did not get the third one passed unanimously. I think there were two dissenting votes in the House. And, uh, beg pardon. Those two fellows won't be back. <laughs> they got beaten the primary, the Republican primary, I might add, back in May. Um, we had one dissenting vote in the Senate, but uh, I had to sort of forgive him. He just lost his bill. It was the most important bill he had been working on all year. It was the last day of the session, and I noticed his voting pattern. He started voting against everything. I think I, my bill just sort of got caught up in his, in his anger. But anyway, three dissenting votes out of the General Assembly, that's about as close to unanimous as you normally would get. We are very excited about the prospects of that making a significant difference. We've already been recognized as the state having the best drug court in the country. And uh, we have people who are working, the judges, the support staff, the probation counselors, the mental health and drug counselors that work in these programs. And if you ever need a pickup, if you ever need to begin to feel good about something that government is doing right, I would invite you to go see a drug court graduation. Uh, my son is a drug court judge in the Superior Courts in the Northeastern Judicial Circuit, and he handles drug court in Hall and Dawson Counties. Now, he's had me there for a couple of times. I finally told him, I said, Jason, I can't come back. He said, why not? I said, well, I have too tender a heart. I can't take it. When you hear the stories, people who had lost everything, women who had lost their families in the custody of their children, living on the streets or in the back of cars, the stories just recount the kind of tragedy that addiction can cause in the life of an individual. And then to hear that when they were given a chance as a second start and they took it, how successful that has been and that they have changed the direction of their life. Now, in case you think that's just a system that's going to pat somebody on the back of the hand and say, go, don't get in trouble again, <laughs> it is far from that. Drug court is a two-year proposition. And you must show that you are drug-free and alcohol-free for a period of time, at least a year, as a general rule, before you are able to graduate. So it's working. I am proud and, here again, thank the members of the General Assembly for agreeing with me that this is something that was worth doing. And I believe it will prove to be even more worthy uh, as time goes on. Well, those are just a few of the things that are going on. Um, let me stop, Joe, and see if you've got questions. Oh, by the way, while you're coming up, let me talk to you about briefly about transportation because I have an idea you might see an Yvonne here. I know Yvonne's <laughs> going to ask me a question about, about transportation. Um, over the last month, roughly a month, a little over a month, we have had uh, groundbreaking ceremonies for two of the major projects on our Interstate 75 corridor. The first one was um, the uh, groundbreaking for the what we call the Northwest Corridor Project, which is the two reversible lanes on 75 north of Atlanta and the one reversible lane forking off on five, I-575 going toward Canton. Um, and then just this past week, we had the groundbreaking on the I-75 south of Atlanta, about a 12-mile stretch there uh, that will also be reversible lanes. Now. The Northwest Corridor Project will be the most expensive transportation project in the history of this state, I am told. And the third one 
is one that is very close to y'all and one that Yvonne has been very, very involved with, and I thank her and her organization for being supportive of it. And that is the building of a new interchange at I-285 and 400. Now, the Northwest Corridor Project, I'm told, is the most expensive project up to this point in time. That project will be even more expensive than the Northwest Corridor Project. But you know what the good news is? All three of those major projects are paid for. They are paid for. And that is something that in the past we've never been able to say as we take on these kinds of multi, multi-million dollar projects in transportation. So we're making progress. Um, we're hearing good results from the three regions, by the way, that passed the T-SPLOS. They're beginning to show that that one penny makes a difference in terms of what they can do for transportation projects in their region. And um, they're going to be putting up signs on those roadways that are being improved, uh, saying this was paid for by t -SPLOS. So maybe that will incentivize some folks who didn't think it was a good idea maybe to rethink it. I don't know. But anyhow, we have good news on the transportation front. Let me stop. Joe? All very good comments and very much in line with a lot of the subjects that we were talking about here today. This question um, comes in regards to the new GM plant. Okay, I'll read it so I do it correctly as it was submitted. In regards to the recent announcement by Dave Schmidt and his company, Macaulay and Schmidt, the old 165-acre GM plant is now about to undergo its long-awaited transformation. The developer can design and build the physical facility, but the real catalyst from an economic development standpoint is, is, is in establishing the identity of the project. The developer and community leaders have voiced a strong interest in a theme oriented towards bio-life science. To achieve this goal, an institutional presence would be required. There is no public medical school in Atlanta. So if a medical college was in, interested in establishing such a presence, would that be something your office could support? <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting question, Joe. And for some of you who uh, know the history of medical colleges in our state and uh, the controversy that has erupted in recent years with the establishment of a, an, a branch, I should say, of the uh, Georgia Regents University, which is the old medical college of Georgia out of Augusta, uh, with a facility in Athens, Georgia. Um, there are many people who are still upset about that and want to be assured that it's not going to detract from Georgia Regents University in Augusta. And we have spent a lot of money trying to make sure that Georgia Regents University will be one of the top 50 uh, hosp teaching hospitals in the United States. It takes a lot of resources to do that, a lot of the things that you have to develop with it. Uh, so I don't know that there's a good quick answer on that one. Let me tell you what we are seeing, though. And this is something that I, I am pleased to see. We had have announced early on in my administration that we were going to try to create 400 new residency slots in Georgia. And the reason being is that if you look at the pattern of doctors, when they go to do their residency program, many of them have to leave our state because we don't have enough residency slots. And unfortunately, sometimes when they do their residency in another state, they get roots that start to be put down and they don't return. And uh, we believe we're losing a lot of doctors because we don't have enough residency slots. Now we have seen communities all across this state uh, through hospitals that are located in their communities be part of this residency program expansion. And they go everywhere from Savannah to Macon to Columbus to Gainesville. Uh, and there are a number of others. Athens is certainly one of them too. Um, those are the areas that I know we have a need in and one that we would have, I think, pretty good support for communities. Now, as I indicated, those are associated with existing hospitals. It is an expensive undertaking even for a hospital who agrees to participate. They have to come up with part of the money to pay for the staff and the training and make space available for uh, residents who are coming into their hospital. Um, the school long term might be a great idea. I think in the short term, realistically, uh, there is so much competition now in terms of funding the schools we have. I don't think that would be a realistic short term goal. I think that answer is going to be really helpful to the people that are going to listen to it because it'll set them on the path that they probably need to then go on. I thank you for that. 
All right, well, the next question is on a, your favorite, one of your favorite subjects on infrastructure. I know you discussed the ongoing developments at the Savannah Port, but let's bring it home for our participants today. What advice can you give to these stakeholders here on how best to ready ourselves for the oncoming economic boom to be had once the port is in operation? Well, the truth is the port provides a lot of opportunities for communities throughout our state. Um, there are certain communities on the I-75 corridor and the I-85 corridor that have become popular places for warehouse facilities, distribution facilities. Uh, on the 85 corridor, Jackson County has certainly become one of those hubs for uh, very, very large distribution uh, locations because they have access to the interstate there. Uh, that's one aspect of what the port can bring in terms of internal jobs within the state. Um, but there are many more, and I, I know that they will continue to, to grow in terms of opportunities for local communities. Uh, probably in a metropolitan area, smaller facilities that can uh, use the services that are coming out of the port uh, as distribution points uh, would be feasible. Uh, to have the large plants and the large uh, warehouse facilities, you have to have a lot of, a lot of space. And that gets to be very expensive in a metropolitan area, as you know. Uh, but there are all sorts of facets of the port's growth that we will see. Now, one of the interesting things that is happening, and it's not talked about too, too much because it's still in the development stages, and that is the possibility of internal ports or within our state, whereby you utilize the two Class I railroads that both have terminals inside of the Port of Savannah. I am told that we are the only port in the United States that has two Class I railroads who actually have, port, have terminals inside of the port facility. Now, um, an interior port on, uh, is going to be something where you would load the, the cargo, the, the containers, off of the ships onto rail cars. You would send them to one of these inland ports, and with the cooperation of the Customs Department, which we understand that they are agreeable to, they would do the customs inspection at the inland port rather than doing it at the Port of Savannah, which clogs up the traffic and everything there and makes it a little more difficult to move things out. Uh, I know that they are looking uh, for locations. You all certainly have some rail lines around here. Uh, I don't know uh, whether that's a feasible uh, undertaking. It certainly would not hurt to be thinking about that and exploring it. I know for sure that they're looking at uh, locations uh, up the 75 corridor, probably a little further north uh, than here, uh, for a location for an inland port. We already have one inland port down in Cordell, and it started slow, but it's beginning to pick up in terms of usage. So that might be an idea that has merit. A very good perspective. Thank you. Um, last one on infrastructure once again, uh, and this will ring more towards the kind of things Yvonne's involved in. As we discuss and consider better ways to mutually utilize our resources at this symposium of the DeKalb Northern Arc between the four cities, it pales in comparison to what you have to look at from a state perspective. So from that vantage point, can you share with us your vision and strategic plan for continued infrastructure investment to connect our major employment centers, like the Savannah Port to Atlanta and even the perimeter to Doraville? And please share with us the issues surrounding the funding of these projects like these. <laughs> That's the kicker right there. <laughs> there are two big, two big problems you must always overcome, especially in a metropolitan area, and that is routes. All of us can remember the difficulty of selecting and getting approval of a, a northern arc route. We never were able to do that. Um, and then, of course, the funding for it becomes uh, an additional concern. Now, I know that the guys in the General Assembly can probably talk with you more about what they've heard from their colleagues. There have been a number of bills that were introduced this past session, for example, uh, to go at the T-SPLOS in a little different format. You know, there were several objections that many people raised about the original format for the T-SPLOS. Some people just did not like their neighbors. They did not like being put in a region with so many folks that they did not think were compatible with them. And that led to projects that their voters saw no value to them to vote for. Um, the suggestion has been that if you 
put it in smaller contingencies, uh, two counties, three counties, whatever, that uh, there would be more commonality and more acceptance of projects. Now, whether or not that has a future in the General Assembly, I don't know. My only real concern about it is uh, we have to be careful we don't build roads to nowhere. Uh, because if you got two counties and they both agree on a changing a two lane to a four lane, but the counties that are on the other ends of those don't agree, you, you have those roads to nowhere where all of a sudden the four lane becomes two lane because they did not have the resources or the desire to do anything about it. Um, but that is a difficult uh, thing to do as to coming to some way to fund it. That one cent is uh, certainly showing progress in the three regions of the state, which are pretty much on the old fall line across the center of our state. And uh, they're showing some really good progress in that regard. Lou, you've been very generous with your time for us today. We're very appreciative. We know you have another event that you need to get to tonight. Your comments were very much in sync with the issues that we've been discussing here on Economic, uh, economic Development Symposium. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give the governor please a warm Thank round you. of applause. Thank you, John.